morning, everyone. My name is Tamila. I'm a clinical health psychologist and currently the first year PhD student at the University of Montpellier. And so I work with uh, Professor Nino on the use of theoretical models in psychological interventions. But before starting, I would like to ask you a question. We're about 300 healthcare practitioners at this Congress, psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, physicians, how many of us apply the theory in their interventions? How many of us use only one theory? And how many of us is an artist who combines several theoretical concepts in his practice? And how many of us does not really feel the need of the use of a theory in his intervention, and he just follows his own um, experience and his, follow his own beliefs? and doesn't really feel the need of, uh, his, uh, of a theory in his intervention. So this is the questions, what, these are the questions which I'm going to present you today. And um, so let's start. Um, as I have said that we are all healthcare practitioners here today and we all work with different populations. Some of us work with children, some of us work with old people, some of us work with burnout patients, some of, we also work with different diseases. Some of us work with obese patients, the others with cancer patients. We also work with, in different contexts. We come from different countries. We, we come from different national healthcare systems. For example, we have guests from Canada, from the UK, uh, from Slovakia, I'm from Russia. So we, we are all different and um, we, um, we work in different law systems. Uh, as well, we work differently in function of uh, the way of deliverance. Some of us work with groups, some of us work in hospitals in the individual way, some of us uh, have their own practitioners' offices in the city center. We all use different techniques, and for example, for psychologists, we may use and combine different techniques more or less in our interventions. For example, um, some of us use more imaginative techniques uh, like exposition in imagination or in vivo. Some of us use more group, uh, group um, interventions, social support. Some of us use biofeedback and uh, I've seen a, a poster in the hall, there is neurofeedback as well in order to show the way of influence of our thoughts on our state of mind and on our health. <coughs> And finally, we apply or not in our, uh, in our interventions on theories. Some of us working with chronic pain patients maybe use the neurometrics theory of pain. Some of us working with burnt out parents, for example, may use a general adaptation syndrome theory. And some of us who is working with behaviors, risky behaviors, maybe work with the trans theoretical model for behavior change. So we are all different, we work in different ways, but all uh, these four uh, components of an intervention really unify us. And what I am working on is the theory used in these interventions. Uh, actually, it has been demonstrated by many research that the use of a theory in an, in an intervention is unavoidable. The, the, the theory used in an intervention can help us first to identify the key concepts of the interventions, the targets of the interventions uh, in, um, in where are we working. Secondly, the theory helps us to better explain the mechanisms of action of an intervention, and that is what Susan Mickey was talking about, that we need to know why the intervention works, how does it work, and what processes are passing from the deliverance of the, uh, of the intervention to the behavior change and to the maintenance of the behavior change. Finally, on the more global way, by applying a theory for this or that context, for this or that type of population, we refine it, we reshape it, and we are adapted for this context, for this population. And I think that this, that is a real good thing because we uh, adapt more and we concrete our interventions. So the theory used um, in an intervention is beneficial for both act actors of the intervention as well for the healthcare practitioner who needs to concretize his intervention and to know uh, each target of the intervention and for the patient who needs to know what we are working for, where are we going and what concepts uh, we are going to work with. So on the one hand we have 
A lot of uh, studies who showed the efficacy uh, of uh, the theory application of an, uh, in an intervention. However, there are some clinical trials who show that there are no really additional effects of uh, theory application in an intervention for behavior change. So the literature is quite inconsistent on this subject. And maybe uh, that is why we have uh, such a wide range of percentage, which was given by Andrew Presswich, who said that from 36 to 89 percent of health interventions are not explicitly based on the theory. This is quite a big range, in my opinion, and uh, maybe um, the problem uh, comes from the other side as well. Um, even if the authors decide to mention a theory in their interventions, we have two options. Some of the authors um, use the theory in a very poor way, like a loose framework, because they want to be published in great journals, and they just put it just in order to be published in a clinical psychology journal, for example. On the other side of the problem, there are some authors which want to be really performant in their study. So they put as many theories as they want, know and they want, but everybody knows the less is the better. Uh, and um, several studies have shown that uh, really the less theories we apply in our intervention, the better, it, uh, the better is its effectiveness. Another uh, issue is that there are too many theories now, and Susan Mickey found in uh, 2014 that there are 83 behavior change theories. Should you talk about all the physiological theories, neurophysiological theories, uh, neurocognitive theories, uh, which we can apply as uh, healthcare <coughs> practitioners in our work? And how t can we choose the best matching theory in our intervention? Another problem which I found uh, well, I, when I was uh, searching the literature on this subject is that, that there is a great hard heterogeneity of study populations and most of the populations were centered on several diseases, on cancer, HIV, tuberculosis. They, uh, they were really centered on different diseases. And what I, what I was thinking about, at what if we make a step back and try to work with the interventions to prevent these diseases? How can we uh, make something that will decline the, the probability of these diseases in our in, in population? That is why I've decided to work with smoking, because according to the Global Burden of Disease Study published in 2017, um, high blood pressure and smoking are the leading risk factors of premature death in the world. Moreover, smoking kills up to half of its users, and I think that if we work on the behavioral, uh, in, if we improve our behavioral interventions, uh, and especially if we pay more attention to the theory used in these interventions, maybe we could um, uh, we could prevent more and more deaths <laughs> who were caused by smoking. So. Um, this research is a part, uh, the, the study which I'm showing you today is just a part of my PhD thesis. And today I would like to answer the following questions. What theories are used in psychological interventions for smoking cessation? And how many psychological interventions for smoking cessation are theory based? In order to answer my questions, I have conducted a research um, and I've decided to work with clinical trials which have been published previously. And my method consisted of double, uh, two round system. First of all, I've searched for the reviews which had been published uh, on smoking cessation. And um, according to my inclusion criteria, then I selected RCTs uh, to construct finally my database for the study. And as you can see on the graph of the left, I've applied many inclusion criteria, <laughs> but I would like to pay your attention more to two things. That first of all, I've decided to work with adult population. And secondly, as we work more on the preventive um, interventions, so we want to prevent people uh, from great and uh, from very grave diseases such as cancer and HIV or tuberculosis. Um, so I've decided to uh, include only Patients who present just, not, not a patients really, smokers who just present this risky behavior of smoking. And that led me to 12 reviews which I found uh, on the Cochrane database, uh, on the Cochrane library. My second step was 
to um, select the clinical trials from these 12 reviews applying exactly the same inclusion criteria. But when I was reading the trials that, we, that had been published, I saw that many authors actually compared several experimental conditions in their, um, in their interventions. And actually, there were m many interventions who had several experimental conditions and one control condition, for example. And I thought that it will be really illogic if I think that if I, for example, registrate an intervention, a trial, which is theory-based, where one experimental condition is theory-based, but the other is not. Uh, that is why I've decided to registrate all the experimental conditions so as an inter independent interventions. However, all the waiting list conditions, uh, the absence of the intervention, or nicotine replacement therapy interventions were not considered as a psychological interventions for smoking cessation. Uh, in order to answer the questions, the heart of the question, the theory used in the intervention, I used several criteria. I considered the intervention as theory-based if it was mentioned in the description of an intervention and it, it was identified through the citation of a previous publication. For example, if the authors cited themselves in a, in a trial, uh, like we've applied exactly the same program with, this, uh, with the same number of sessions, but for another for another population. So I've searched for that trial which was cited. Secondly, um, I considered uh, the, the, uh, the intervention as theory-based if it was used to select or to screen the participants. Exactly it has been for the trans-theoretical model of behavior change when uh, the authors actually, they, um, uh, they registrated uh, each time they measured the progression of a person through the time. Um, the stage of change of a, of a smoker. In all the other cases, I did not consider the intervention as theory-based. Even if the authors uh, discussed their results, reframing it by some theory, uh, I did not consider it as theory-based because it was done after the intervention. So let's move to the first results, which I found uh, general results. 12 systematic reviews, 262 RCTs, uh, 426 psychological interventions, which led me to 156,497 participants. As you can see, the great majority of interventions were conducted and <laughs> delivered in the USA, which is not a surprise, I think. <laughs> and as you can see, the, fortunately, the major providers of the interventions were psychologists, counselors, so-called, and physicians. However, as you can see on the graph, Self-help interventions take more and more importance in, uh, in our healthcare interventions. Um, nearly half of the interventions were psychoeducative. I'm sorry for the presentation, I don't know why. So in the blue, this is psychoeducation. So 70% of the interventions were delivered in the individual way, and 40%, this is in uh, blue, 40% of the interventions were um, used nicotine replacement therapy in their uh, intervention. The more I was working with clinical trials, the more I registered each intervention, the more I was surprised by a great confusion which was done by the authors, by healthcare practitioners. Actually, I found a great confusion about the naming of, the, of a, an intervention because some authors used a method to name the intervention, the others talked about more techniques, the others gave a name to their intervention, uh, and there were many synonyms of the intervention. I can give an example, behavioral treatment, behavior therapy, behavioral counseling, behavioral skills training. I was trying to find are there any maybe similarities between them or they are completely different, some of them were different, some of them were really the same. So that led me to 178 different types of interventions for 426 <coughs> interventions that I registered in total. However, there were some categories which were really um, redundant and uh, which were really frequently used by the authors. For example, I found that proactive telephone counseling, telephone counseling, hypnos hypnosis, CBT, motivational interviewing, and advice 
were the most frequently used interventions for sm uh, psycho in psycho in by psychologists or physicians in their interventions for smoking cessation. I think that uh, advice was so popular because it, it was very easy to deliver and easy to measure the efficacy uh, up to the end. Uh, speaking about more, um, more specific results that I got about the theory used, the heart of the question, is that, um, I don't know, unfortunately maybe the version of the PowerPoint does not really correspond to my <laughs> mine. So 40, uh, this was 46% of the interventions were theory-based, <coughs> nearly a half. So 42% um, were not theory-based. All the rest were, uh, uh, I didn't have any access to these publications. They were uh, unaccessible. Uh, from the interventions which were uh, theory-based, I found that 82% in green were based on a single theory, while all the rest, 18%, uh, were uh, used several, a set of theories in their intervention. Uh, each time I was searching for, the, for a theory in a trial, in a publication, and what I found is uh, 35 explicit theories in, um, in, all the, in my database. Um, I don't know if I should exp uh, expli uh, explain the, the difference between implicit and explicit theories. Implicit theories are really basic belief, uh, beliefs which we have uh, in our life on, from our professional experience. How people, how we professionals understand the world. While explicit theories, uh, they have been uh, published, tested. Um, as you can see, uh, so uh, I've uh, put them in the descending order of uh, frequency use. And as you can see on this graph, even 35 years after its first publication, trans theoretical model of behavior change still remains dominant in psychological interventions for smoking cessation and especially it's five times more cited than the second place who takes a social cognitive theory. My question is, why is it so popular? <laughs> Here you can see uh, this, uh, the second, so the, the last uh, 15 uh, theories which I found. And uh, one point which I would like to pay your attention to as well is that I found that the authors of four interventions mentioned theory used in, the, uh, without the, in their intervention without giving any details. And here I can give you a wonderful example where they say that, yeah, we use a theory, but what is the counseling theory? If we make a Google search, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I didn't really understand uh, how can I find what is the, uh, the, who is the author of this theory? Or <laughs> So how can we interpret uh, now these results? So 42% of psychological interventions for smoking cessation are not theory-based. But how, what, what can we take from this percentage? Does it, does it really improve the efficacy of the intervention or not? Uh, and maybe, maybe we don't really need the, inter the, the theories in our practice. In order to answer these questions, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to find the best matching criteria of uh, effectiveness of, of smoking cessation intervention um, because uh, the study is running now. And I'm going to compare theory-based interventions for smoking cessation uh, effectiveness with the effectiveness of non-theoretical uh, interventions on short, mid, and long term. Secondly, so about a half of interventions for smoking cessation mentioned at least one theory. But what was the intensity of the use of these theories? Because as we can see, some authors did not really care about the intensity of use. They just put it, they published, they gain. So I think that it, this question is really important. And finally, maybe we should talk not about theories, but about theoretical constructs. And maybe we should find maybe some uh, overlaps is between the theoretical constructs, between <coughs> theories, uh, to pay more attention to some targets of the behavioral change interventions. In order to answer these questions, what I'm going to do is to use uh, Blumenmann's methodology, which he had used, uh, using Mickey's theory coding system, where each trial, actually, he uh, gains some score points by responding or not to some criteria of uh, theory use uh, intensity in an intervention. Secondly, to, in order to respond to the second question, what I'm going to do is to refer to 
theoretical domains framework proposed by James Kane, who proposed <coughs> 14 theoretical frameworks which I can use and uh, which I can use to dispatch the theoretical concepts with I, which I found and to find the overlapses. So <coughs> we were talking all these two days about many confusions in the non-pharmacological interventions. For instance, unfortunately, <laughs> we can find this state of art. And uh, with the purpose of this <coughs> Congress, the purpose of our work is to better clarify what populations, what interventions we use for which populations, for, with what techniques, and uh, what theories we should use in our interventions. Because finally, I think that we should apply and practice <coughs> complex interventions where each component is carefully chosen, basing on scientific evidence. So, um, there is a great uh, lack in the description of the MPIs, in the description of non-pharmacological uh, interventions. And I think the, the we, platform SEPs, <laughs> we propose that uh, we healthcare practitioners should, be, should uh, pay more attention to the description of our interventions. And uh, so I, I will continue working on the mechanisms of action component of this scheme. Thank you so much for your attention.